Hey everyone, it's Rob and thanks for listening in today. I greatly appreciate your time as always. My guest today is Sensei Koshi Paley Ellison. Koshin is an author, Zen teacher, Jungian psych psychotherapist, and ACPE certified chaplaincy educator. After more than a decade as the chaplain and psychotherapist, Koshin co-founded the New York Zen Center for Contemplative Care. The nonprofit center offers contemplative approaches to care through education, care partnering, and Zen practice. Today, New York Zen Center's methodologies are internationally recognized and have touched the lives of tens of thousands of individuals. Koshin is a renowned thought leader in contemplative care. His work has been featured in the New York Times, PBS, CBS Sunday Morning, and other media outlets. He's the author of Untangled, Walking the Eightfold Path to Clarity, Courage, and Compassion, Wholehearted, Slow Down, Help Out, Wake Up, and the co-editor of Awake at the Bedside, Contemplative Teaching on Palliative and End-of-Life Care. Koshin began his formal Zen training in 1987, and he is a recognized Soto Zen teacher by the American Zen Teachers Association, White Plum Asanga, and Soto Zen Buddhist Association. He serves on the board of directors at the Soto Zen Buddhist Association, New York Zen Center for Contemplative Care, and Bar Center for Buddhist Studies. He has completed six years of training at the Jungian Psychoanalytic Association, as well as a clinical contemplative training at both Mount Sinai Beth Israel Medical Center and New York Presbyterian Medical Center. He is an ACPE certified educator, chaplain, and Jungian psychotherapist. His academic appointments include co-director and contemplative care services for the Department of Integrative Medicine and as the chaplaincy supervisor for the pain and palliative care department at Mount Sinai Beth Israel Medical Center, where he has also served on the Medical Ethics Committee for 18 years. He's currently on the faculty of the University of Arizona Medical School Center for Integrative Medicine's Integrative Medicine Fellowship, on the faculty of the Integrative Medicine Fellowship of the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine, and he is a visiting professor at the McGovern Center for Humanities and Ethics, of the University of Texas Health Science Center of Houston Medical School. So obviously he is quite credentialed. Now, Koshin and I talk about what it means to, to, to be truly alive in every moment. We also talk about his amazing book, Untangled. You're going to love his easy nature and the humor he brings to our conversation. So please enjoy my conversation with Koshin. About the Buddhist tradition is that it's 2,600 years old. And not that that means something in particular, but it is about 88 generations. And over those generations, you see the same patterns. <laughs> so oftentimes people will say like, oh, social media, or, or it's the way our society is, or whatever. It just seems to be the way things are. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there is a habit, you know, our brains are deeply repetitive, and they really like repetition. And so to change, and to be open, actually takes a little bit of work. And it's something that some people call hard. It's hard to do, to stay curious and open. And yet, I find that that's one of the places where we can really foster, that would, has been true for me, mm -hmm. that I've been able to foster a sense of clarity and courage and love, you know, mm -hmm. and it's just, um, what comes to mind is I was just talking with some students literally just about half an hour ago where we're talking about the how rare it is to really root yourself 
in anything that we kind of tend to say, oh, I'm distracted or it's too hard or I'll try a lot of different things. I'll do it and use an app now and I'll use this. But at a certain point, we have to, in my experience, if we want to really be free, oh, you know, we at a certain point, we have to, you know, plant our staff in the ground and say, I am here, you know, in the Bible, you know, it's a, this is beautiful expression called hineni, which means I am here. That is said, it's one of the most frequent um, phrases in the Bible. And there's something very powerful about that. Like he named me is like, I am here. Mm -hmm. And there was also something that Leonard Cohen sang in one of his last songs, you know, the, that he recorded, he named me. It's like that, how rare it is that we are really where we are. Mm -hmm. And so learning how to plant ourselves deeply. And I feel like more and more, the, the deeper I go into my own traditions, the more possibilities are all around me because I can be so deep uh, and yet so alive and curious. Mm -hmm. You know, my my dear friend, Taroni Lodog, she's this incredible human and physician, and she's one of the leaders of our Contemplative Medicine Fellowship. And she has is a steward of some land, a ranch outside of Pecos, New Mexico, like pretty deep in there where there are fires often. And there's a great cedar tree there, massive, so wide. And this cedar tree doesn't get burned. It gets singed, but it doesn't burn. And it's so interesting because she says, you know, it's just so deep in the earth. Mm -hmm. that it's so connected to what's wet and it for me it's such a wonderful image and she calls the tree tomas and uh you know the, what the teaching of tomas is like wow you can go so deep that you know the fires of life will come mm -hmm. for sure mm -hmm. we can that's guaranteed and yet what we do with that is where we can really explore mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Your background, I, I was looking at your education. You have a lot of it. <laughs> and you're a Jungian, did I say that? Psychotherapist yeah. as well. Yeah. What started you on this path of learning and becoming a psychotherapist and later now doing the work that you do? Uh, in, in at the New York Zen Center? Mm. I think my education has really just been following what feels alive. And I do have many degrees, which sometimes feels funny <laughs> in a certain way. Because <laughs> uh, I did, because I was not like a career oriented person. And and though it looks like that. So I, after I finished school, my undergraduate degree, you know, I just got, I was a writer and really thinking about it as well. I was practicing and good at therapy and having a lot of fun and adventuring around the world. And I was a writer who just, and I went to Spain and someone handed me a book called What the Living Do. And it was this incredible book of poems by a woman named Marie Howe. And I was like, well, whoever this person is, I wanna spend a lot of time with this person <laughs> because whatever she's doing in this book feels so alive and visceral. Mm -hmm. And the way to actually talk about her life and her grief and her joy and all of it was so mm, vital. Mm. So I said, whatever it is, I don't even, because actually the photograph of her uh, in that book is like, you can't really see her face. I was like, whoever this mysterious woman is, I'm going to follow her for a while. <laughs> and 
And so I found that she was teaching at Sarah Lawrence College. And I was like, mm. well, how do you study with her? I was like, oh, she teaches an MFA. I'll get an MFA. <laughs> That's great. You know, I often, you know, the second time mentioning Leonard Cohen, just I love Leonard Cohen. And mm -hmm. he, you know, just says about his teacher, he said, you know, if his teacher was a carpenter, he would have become a carpenter, but he was a Zen monk, so he became a Zen monk. So like, I just felt like, she's teaching in an MFA program, I'll do an MFA, like whatever that is. And, uh, and we actually, that was the beginning of, you know, studying with Marie and also our now like, wow, like 25 year mm. friendship. Wow. Uh, so we've been very good friends for a long time. Mm. And, uh, but to me, like each of my degrees have really been about where do I feel alive and where do I feel connected? And, you know, I was doing hospital chaplaincy after my mother, my grandmother died because it was the only thing that made sense to me to be a companion with people and to have no bullshit conversations. After she died, I just like couldn't tolerate small talk for a period of time. Mm -hmm. So being with people in extremis is really good medicine for that mm -hmm. and and during that time <laughs> you know with the, these extraordinary people that i got the ch the privilege to be at the bedside with you know one woman in particular who's you know i write about her but she was you know in the inpatient oncology floor like people are very sick and so and they're usually in the process of dying, but sometimes they go out of the hospital and they wanted to keep working with me. And I uh, thought, well, as a chaplain, I'm not really trained to do that. And so, oh, I could become a, and this one woman said, well, you could become a social worker. I said, that's a good idea. And so I just enrolled in a social work program and went <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, that would be useful. That's useful. And then I realized like I wanted to study more to know how to work with people in a psychodynamic and imaginative way. And one of my mentors of many years, James Hillman, you know, suggested I go to this Jungian Psychoanalytic Association to choose some training. And so he's very wise. And so I just follow what he said. And so I did that for six years. You know, like I just, <laughs> I <laughs> I don't know if that makes any sense, but. Well, it makes all the sense in the been. world, really. You know, what comes to my mind for, as you share this is, you know, I'm thinking about, especially some, you know, maybe uh, younger people these days and, who are fortunate enough to sort of chart a path for themselves. Maybe, mm -hmm. you know, if you go to the right school and you do this and this, and then you get into this kind of business, whether it's uh, medicine or, you know, uh, law or business, whatever, finance, whatever it might be. And maybe you find yourself at a certain point, 10 years after wondering what the heck you did. And uh, I, I wondered how you had maybe an intuition of some, in some way to not have charted such a path for yourself, but allow things to unfold as you made your way through life. You know, today is a very um, special day, um, which is brings to me, my mind, the things that you're talking about, these young, young people and who are entrepreneurs also. And, Actually, there's two of them in the other room mm. um, who are sitting and committing themselves to a Zen path mm. because I think they came to a similar juncture that you're talking about. For me, I had a very different orientation because as a very young person, I was very aware that I could die. Um, I experienced extreme forms of violence, um, both in my home and outside my home, both through anti-Semitic attacks and hunting, and which is terrifying to even say those words. And 
And so I was just very aware that um, this, what we, you know, I often call is like our meat puppet, this like, <laughs> you know, this body that we have, like I never assumed that it would continue because actually I had so many experiences where I was like pretty sure it wouldn't. And something about that and then finding um, my first teacher who was a karate teacher and who as a young person at 11 years old, you know, he had us sit in Seiza, which is with your, on your knees, with your feet underneath your butt on a wood floor. It's really painful. <laughs> you know, not like the bougie kind of sitting in a nice place. It was in like this smelly mildewy basement. <laughs> was not looking at some vista or a candle or <laughs> um, but he really used to have us sit like that before we would begin to move and he said you know you'll never be free until you can be still with your pain mm. and so I got very interested as an 11 year old kid which I understand is unusual mm -hmm. from, a, from a certain perspective that I really wanted to learn that. And I really began to understand that most suffering in myself and the people around me who were, it was like the beginning of compassion, I think. And for the people who are inflicting pain on me, because mm -hmm. like they had great values. It was kind of clear, but their actions were terrible. And so that gap I became super interested in. And I think that maybe that's what you're talking about, that we don't tend to be taught how to bring those things together. How do we have an integrated life where we, what the values that we say that we have rarely match what we do with our time. And you know, working, I've had the privilege of working with many dying people who actually knew that they were dying because we're all dying. And, uh, <laughs> but most of us are pretending that we're not, but it's, a. Uh, but I think it's really important to, that the regrets always are about that gap, that their values and what they did with their time, like, completely mm -hmm. so that gap so the amazing opportunity we have and i feel privileged to actually like experience that in myself and have the life of service of trying to encourage others to whatever their values are and how they want to function can come together and that actually you can do that that's something you can actually do Right, which is like amazing. You could actually choose <laughs> to focus on what the hell are you doing with yourself and to not, you know, mess around. Well, some you have to have fun, but like to, <laughs> <laughs> but I think that that is, um, for me, is really hard one it's not like I have it figured out but it is something that I really care about mm -hmm. and to me when I'm touching into that it feels so life-giving mm -hmm. it's like to me a source of vitality when like I feel that what I'm saying and what I'm doing are like mm -hmm. matching up you feel it the spark yeah mm -hmm. you know delicious I that's right. You 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 got me thinking about something. First of all, when I read this part where and you mentioned it, I'm not sure the listeners completely understand what you meant when you said hunting. And it really threw me off when I read this in your book that you were literally hunted as a child by other kids that were anti-Semitic. That's it's there's no words for it, but you mentioned compassion. And I wondered at that time, did you have a sense of compassion 
as that 11 year old, or I can't remember your exact age when that was happening. Or now, as you look back, how do you find the compassion? Well, to be honest, like I didn't really remember that part of it until writing this book. Is know? that right? And wow. Yeah. It was like one of those things that our brain kind of seals, you know, and because one of the things about writing this book was that was really important for me. And I feel that it's an ethical obligation as a teacher and as a writer to share. If I'm going to say, here's where we go, I have to say, and this is how I I can companion you in that. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's just critical. Otherwise, it's kind of bullshit. It's like easy to talk about these things. And so part of the, you know, the book is really this arc of where, how do we move from our suffering, our tangles, our overwhelm, our horrific histories or whatever that is, and how do we move into freedom? And that's the Four Noble Truths of Buddhism. And so I really wanted to go deeply in that. And, and in that process, you know, lots of memories came up. And so it was actually, you know, biking home one night here in Manhattan and the light had just gotten, you know, that beautiful moment when the sky just kind of pops into a deep blue. It's one of my favorite times of day. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and I was biking and through this kind of wooded area and just something about that quality of light where it's just like very, very dim and especially in a kind of foresty area that just that memory just like hit me literally and I fell off my bicycle and uh and it what was different was that you know and I remembered you know being chased through these woods by these kids who are on their four wheels with their guns shooting at me like die Jew die die you know which is you know, it's like a nightmare. You know, it's actually like a oh yeah, like like deliverance is like a real thing. You know, and it's uh, and I was able to kind of because it was dark and because they had to stay on a certain path. I just dove into this kind of all of these this briar of blackberries, which sounds nice, but actually it tears up your skin. You know, it's like the it was a horrific moment. Yeah. And so I just, you know, fell off my bike remembering that and just saying like, I was able to, because of my practice, able to really come back to, okay, Koshin, you're okay. You're not, they're not chasing you anymore. And to me, you ask about compassion. It's like, yeah, what makes a child? They were like, they were older than me for sure. They're probably late teenagers, 18, 19. What makes someone do that? What has happened to that person that they can see another person as an object to keep, make something as a hated thing? I mean, I was, I was probably 12 years old like what would make someone want to murder a child and so to me just that question I don't have the answers to that question but I think that to me the question is what is what fosters compassion because I don't know the answer for them but I know like my goodness how horrible would that be to actually really think that that's a good activity mm -hmm. and it's like really like lord of the flies you know like lord of the flies is a real thing mm -hmm. and to see that we all have that capacity to do great harm and great beautiful things is really important to see how depending on our conditions that we're in we can really go really different ways yeah 
Mm. It's powerful. Thank you for that. I'm wondering if at any point, once this memory came to you, if you spent any time on any kind of practice that helped you in some way or helped them maybe. To me, you know, there's this expression in our Zen tradition called continuous practice. And so where everything is a moment of practice, getting back on your bike is a place of practice. And what I mean by practice is that truly, so you're asking about what practices to me, like literally every moment is a place of practice where I have an opportunity to be grounded, to be soft, to be open and upright and loving. You know, and like that is always the opportunity. And so for me, you know, I've been practicing for, you know, about four, almost four decades. And so like, and there's something about the steadiness of diving in, diving in, diving in, and where everything becomes filled with possibility. To me, like that has been what's been most helpful. And it's about the, we actually change. <laughs> when you devote yourself like Tomas to having deep roots, you actually change. Mm -hmm. It's like transformation is actually a real thing, except no one can provide it for you and no pill or, you know, I think that, you know, it's very interesting now with the psychedelics people are getting, there's so many helpful things about them, but I think that we can get intoxicated thinking that that's going to be a sustained way of reaching that. And I love Michael Baum's book and the end of his book, he's like, well, you, you can basically just meditate every day. <laughs> You know, and I yeah, think that yeah. that for me, that's been the greatest medicine to have a steady practice, have a really great teacher, mm -hmm. have beautiful spiritual friends. Like, mm -hmm. I think I'm at a point in my life where it's about kind of cultivating the whole and not just trying one thing, you know, like I have a great therapist or, you know, with great friends, you know, a very rich life and a beautiful marriage and cute cats. And, you know, like it's, it's like a good situation. And <laughs> so I think that to me, it's about now in my life, just how am I cultivating the richness and fullness of it so that it actually, again, mirrors the what I say I value and care about mm -hmm. so you know it's like the what I do every morning before I leave the house you know I have a whole morning situation because you know what we can do we can't control results but we can work with the conditions so every morning I really work on the conditions and do exercise I do sit with our sangha have some something yummy to eat and then before I leave every day you know I always hold Jodo's face and do it both my hands and just tell him how much I love him you know and I've never left the house without doing that mm. and it's something that I learned from being working working in the emergency department where pretty much everyone who came who was coming in to care for someone who was in the emergency department said, I can't believe how we left this morning or I, you know, it was, I didn't even say goodbye. You know, I didn't even. And so ever since then, I just don't take things for granted, but then that has kind of rippled out everywhere. <laughs> like, wow. I get that. Like I have a hat, like, <laughs> Like, I feel like, wow, fingers, 